Hi there, my name is Zach DePiero, and I'm an assistant teaching professor of English and Composition at Penn State Abington, which is just outside of Philadelphia. Today, I'd like to lead you through an exploratory study that I conducted on what I'm calling COGS, an acronym that stands for Classroom Observation Guidelines, C-O-G-S. COGS can include rubrics, checklists, forms, any articulations of how in-class teaching practices are assessed at a given site. So I've been teaching for a dozen years now at various levels, junior high, high school, college, and perhaps like a lot of you, I've gotten observed many times. And just about every time the observer changed, the students changed, my lesson changed, even I had changed. So when you think about it, there's a rhetorical situation underlying classroom observations that's always changing, that's constantly in flux. And I find that really interesting and also possibly problematic. So I decided that I wanted to study this in further depth. I have two research questions that drove this study. One, what rhetorical situations underlie classroom observations? What do we know about its purposes, its writers, its audiences? And two, uh, how can we productively problematize our understanding of this cog genre to enhance the teaching and learning of writing? So I decided to examine cogs at programs that were awarded the C's Certificate of Excellence. When I collected data in the summer of 2018, 68 different programs had earned that distinction up to that point. From this larger group, I solicited what I'd call a purposeful stratified sample. Uh, I, I looked for COGS with respect to the type of writing program, the type of institution, and the year that the certificate was awarded. I settled on 17 total COGS for my corpus, and that represents just over a quarter of the total number of programs awarded this certificate of excellence up to that point. So now I'd like to begin to share some of my findings in two parts. Part one, I'll dive into what I've learned about some of the rhetorical situations. And part two, I'd like to introduce a concept uh, that I'm calling paragenres. First though, I wanna take a moment to talk about the titles of COGS because they offer clues as to this genre's immediate social uptake. Consider a checklist. Uh, a checklist offers a series of quickly observable, doable phenomena, not so dissimilar from a to-do list, which has a pretty clear mission, right? Check the boxes. Uh, alternatively, another possibility is probably something that a lot of us have experienced. I know I have. Uh, a purely open-ended classroom observation that isn't based on a cog at all, an observer shows up to your classroom, you hand over any relevant materials, and the rest is in their hands. Each of these approaches poses a different set of uh, affordances and constraints on both the instructor and the observer. Um, in one person's eyes, that previous open-ended example, um, that might best capture the spirit of a classroom. You've got this ecosystem sprawling, teeming with complex social activity that's unfolding in real time. Someone else though might advocate for a checklist uh, claiming that explicitly identifying the, cr the criteria that's being used for evaluation is essential for uh, transparency and parity, uh, reliability and validity, development and competency. So what titles emerged from this corpus? Far and away, form was used more than anything else. It appeared in seven out of the 17 COGS, which accounts for roughly 40% of the data set. Checklist and report were each used twice, uh, and the following titles were each used once. Rubric, sheet, visit, and template. Uh, two titles were missing from the corpus suggesting that this program conducted classroom observations in that previous 
uh, aforementioned open-ended way. So now I'd like to discuss the, the purposes of COGS. Folks tend to frame teaching observations uh, in terms of formative assessment and or summative assessment. The question still remains though, formative and summative assessment of what exactly? I'm interpreting the purposes of this genre as the various pedagogical competencies that are listed in the COGS. So across the corpus of COGS, I, I spotted some commonalities uh, as well as some anomalies. I'll start with the commonalities. Many COGS drew observers' attention to the presence of clear lesson objectives or goals, a thoughtful structure to class, and supportive interactions with students. Many COGS also asked observers to provide a description of what transpired during class, to note the perceived strengths of the instructor, and to suggest areas for possible improvement. Conversely, across COGS, less common pedagogical competencies emerged. These drew observers' attention to an instructor's professionalism, the physical space of the classroom, moments of differentiated instruction, and how the ins instructor concluded class. One really unique COG asked observers to weigh in on the instructor's principles, such as how the instructor asks students to repurpose prior knowledge, uh, to what extent they seem to respect students' labor, and in what ways they assess students' work in ethical ways. So now I wanna to pivot to that second part of my findings uh, and introduce this concept that I'm calling para-genres. Uh, this is a finding I believe that's noteworthy because it, it points to just how hard to pin down and, and enigmatic this cog genre is. So many participants responded to my outreach with their program's cog, but then they also passed along this additional supplementary material. Uh, I'm calling that those materials para-genres. They have this perimeter-like just beyond quality, this, this, uh, this proximal relationship to the genre. And it contextualizes how that cog functions in some way at that site. Um, and it also reveals additional information about uh, peripheral audiences for the cog genre, as well as uh, secondary uh, unforeseen uh, purposes. I'll give you a, for instance, at one site, the WPA, in addition to the cog, passed along a statement of teaching principles. I'm calling that a para-genre. Within that document, there was a footnote to that program's um, outcomes for first year composition. That intertextuality there tells us uh, there's a relationship between that program's COG, the statement of teaching principles, and their outcomes of first year composition. 18 different para genres emerge from this inquiry. Um, and I kind of see five tiers or almost like five orbits uh, with varying degrees of gravitational pull in play here. I want to outline them just a little bit in the next slide here. So in tier one, tier one includes genres that most directly shape the end product of a classroom observation. Here we're talking about something like a, a post-observation narrative reflection that the instructor might need to complete. Tier two includes genres to be taken into consideration before or during the observation that factors back into the COG in some way, uh, such as the core syllabus, assignment prompts, the lesson plans. In tier three, there are genres, para-genres, that don't immediately address teaching and learning in the class at that moment, but nonetheless still shape the classroom observation in some way, such as uh, program, programmatic statements about pedagogical values. Tiers four and five uh, include genres that are associated with gaining and sustaining 
uh, employment, such as summaries of previous uh, student course evaluations or timelines for promotion and tenure. To close here, I wanna circle back to my choice of the COG acronym. So in a literal sense, a COG is a tooth, a mechanical tooth that helps facilitate the connection and the movement between parts. On a bike, for instance, uh, each COG on the sprocket has a bite that grabs the bike chain. Uh, once that bike chain becomes taut, riders can pedal, put those wheels into motion. That's all made possible by COGS. COG can also, though, carry a negative connotation with phrases like COG in a wheel and COG in the machine. These phrases invoke the idea that an employee is a small, interchangeable, and therefore inconsequential part of a greater whole. At the same time, each cog is required for that greater system to function. So to extend this biking metaphor, I suppose that uh, as teachers and, and teacher educators, the big question for us to answer here is, what kind of bike will help us get to where we wanna go? Thank you for checking out my work here. Feel free to get in touch. My email address is right there. Uh, I'm more detailed version of my study here is in a collection titled Writing the Classroom. Hopefully it'll be forthcoming. I believe it's uh, possibly under contract now with Utah State University Press. Once our conference concludes, I'm gonna upload this to YouTube in case you'd like to use it. And finally, uh, here is information for the various images that I used in this presentation. Take care, good luck wrapping up teaching this semester, this quarter. And hopefully I'll see you uh, in person again sometime down the road. Bye.